We are in the eighth lesson in the book of Deuteronomy, and we are in chapter 10 of that fifth book of the Old Testament. So if you're opening up your Bible and you want to know where Deuteronomy is, just start at the beginning and kind of roll through five books and you'll come to that book of Deuteronomy. Now in our last study, Moses had been sent down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, where he had been with the Lord for 40 days, 40 nights, because the camp uh, had broken one of the newly given Ten Commandment laws. And what they had done was they had crafted a golden calf to worship as their new God. Because Moses had been up there so long, they couldn't figure out where he was. Been up there 40 days and 40 nights. So they needed a God. They needed a leader. So Moses... The Lord told Moses to descend down the mountains, and he did, and he had the two tablets that had been carved and inscribed by the finger of God with the uh, Ten Commandments on them, on the two tablets. And as Moses came down the mountain, he saw the golden calf, and in his anger, Moses threw the tablets, and he broke them. And then he chastised the camp and he took that golden calf that they had created and he crushed it into dust and he poured the dust into the stream of water that ran through the camp coming from that, coming from that flint rock that the Lord had had Moses to strike in order to provide, provide drinking water for the camp. And once the camp was disciplined, Moses then climbed back up the mountain for another 40 days with the Lord. And during that time, two new tablets were prepared. So as we enter chapter 10 of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is remembering back of those 40 days, that second set of 40 days, 40 years before when it happened, as he, was, uh, as he gives here to us a summary of the rewritten tablets as well as a summary of the rewards that come with obedience. So first, we will learn about the new stones and a case to hold them in verse 1. At that time, the Lord said to me, Cut out for yourself two tablets of stones like the former ones and come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood for yourself. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood and cut out two tablets of stone like the former ones and went up on the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. He wrote on the tablets like the former writings, the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are as the Lord commanded me. Now down in the camp before Moses ascended to that mountain to be with the Lord, he did two things. He cut out two new stones that matched the two stones that the Lord had cut out and had written the Ten Commandments upon. And Moses also built an ark. <clears throat> now, this is not the Ark of the Covenant. That ark would be crafted by skilled craftsmen later on after Moses had come down from the mountain following the second 40 days. But this ark was made of wood by Moses as a case to hold the two tablets when he brought them back down from the mountain at the end of the second 40 days. Now the word ark simply means a chest, and we would call it a box. <clears throat> so this wooden box was made by Moses for the stones of the Ten Commandments to be stored in, guess where? Inside the Ark of the Covenant. So he's going to make a box that holds these stones that the whole box will go inside the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so he had to make this box uh, perfectly to keep them safe. And with that, I got news for you. We can estimate the size of the stones because of that box and also the size of the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was two and a half cubits long 
by one and a half cubic wide and high. So if you're looking at that arc of the covenant from, the, from, the, uh, from one end, it looks like it's a square. But when you look at it front on, it looks like a rectangle. Tangle. Now a cubit is a standard of measurement that can fluctuate greatly depending on who set the standard of the cubic. The cubic was the length from the tip of the elbow to the tip of the longest finger. Did you get that? Tip of the elbow to the tip of the longest finger. And that length varied from man to man. Therefore, at the building site, here's how this worked. <clears throat> because you couldn't just everybody say, okay, measure from your elbow to the tip of your finger and cut out some stones to fit and cut out this to fit and cut this wood. This is woodwork they're doing. They're going to cover it in gold and it has to fit perfectly. They have no nails. They have no screws. They're going to use wooden pins and wooden pegs. And so it has to fit perfectly. So when you see the word cubic, it's, it's interesting. We're used to, let me back up, up just a minute. We are so used to using a ruler. And I don't know if you can see this, but we're used to inches, inches and feet and yards, inches, feet, and yards. This actually is a four foot ruler that I use to draw things on the board. And I know, no, you all want to know how I get the straight lines. Well, I use that ruler to get the straight lines. That's the Western way of thinking. But in the Eastern way of thinking, they would use cubics. And it did not matter in inches what an inch was or anything to anybody because they didn't have that. So they would use a cubic and what would happen is the foreman would come out on the, on the plan of whatever they're doing and he would go up to a wall or to a rock or somewhere and he would take and he would take a stone or, or something, a scribe, and he'd put his arm up there and he'd mark his elbow on the wall and he'd mark the tip of his, of his finger on the wall and then everyone else would go get them a stick because that's the cubic. It really doesn't matter whether it's 17 and a half inches, 18 inches, 18 and a half inches, 19 inches, 19 and a half inches, 16 and a half inches. It doesn't matter. Whatever the foreman's longest was. And so let me take a stick like we take a stick here. All right. Take a stick. We come down and we measure from the elbow up to the up on the top of the stick. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a line right there. That is the line for the cubic. That's how long it is from the, my elbow up to the tip of my finger. So that becomes the standard. His measurement, his measurement as the foreman, whatever he set, was called the rule, R-U-L-E, by which all the measurements are based. So what happened is some of the other folks, the, everybody else out there, everybody had to have a rule. Uh, had to have a ruler, by the way, for the rule. And they would go get them their stick, and they would come up here, and they would match it up to the stick, and they would cut it off, just like that. So this would be the standard for the rule. The stick that got copied, th this is the, like the sticks that were copies of that original rule that was set up. So everybody knew, and they called this the ruler that they had, and they carried around with them because they, this was the law of the standard of the measurement for the build. Now, the ruler was then marked in half, and what they would do, and I'm going to use a piece of little cardboard here, they'd take a piece of reed or a piece of string or something, that was, and they'd make it the exact length of the cubic. They would then fold it in half exactly, and they would mark the halfway point. And when they marked the halfway point, they had a half. So it was, if it was a cubic and a half, they knew where the halfway mark was. Then they would fold it again, and they would mark the quarter on both sides. Then they would fold it again, and they would mark the eighths. So you would have half, quarters, eighths, all the way through. You know... <clears throat> The average man's cubic was 17 and a half inches in Israel. That's the average man. But average was not good enough in a, in a precision build. Therefore, the man's measurement became, that foreman's measurement became the rule for all the, inch, all the measurements on all the build. 
When you're cutting out a long beam that's got to fit into a mortise and a tendon into the tabernacle, or you're, you're doing a fine woodworking project like building an Ark of the Covenant <clears throat> that's fine woodworking put together with, uh, with golden pegs and then going to be covered in gold, everything has to be perfect. So for our purpose, and we will not be with in an inch or two right on this, but, but uh, or I'll say we will be within an inch or two right on this. We will use this, this ruler as 18 inches as the rule for the cubic because that's happened to be what this is. This is mine. It's 18 inches. So with 18 inches for the rule of the cubic, because you're going by me and I'm the foreman and we're going to build this Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was about 45 inches long and 27 inches wide and high. 45 wide, 27 wide, I mean 45 long, 27 wide, and 27 high. And for sturdiness, those joints did not have glue. They didn't have nails. They didn't have screws. They weren't invented yet. But they were put together with wooden pegs, as I've already said. That is where they'd take boards and put them together. They'd drill a hole and put a piece of board inside there going the opposite direction. This meant that the measurements inside this Ark of the Covenant where these tablets are going to be was about, 44, about 40 inches long by 23 inches wide. And here's the reason why I tell you that. and Wide and high. It's because... In order to have a sturdy build, because they're going to put poles, uh, they're going to put poles through it and carry it, that wood probably was about an inch and a half to two inches thick in order for it to all be able to hold together and with, withstand through the ages. Because remember, this is a long time before plywood or anything like that. And so when we consider that, we have to take inches off for the inside. So the inside's going to be about 40 inches wide, uh, 40 inches long inside the case and 23 inches wide and high on the, on the end. Okay. So considering that the arc, it's the, the arc case for the stone would also have boards that are about two inches thick, uh, inch and a half to two inches thick. The stones could have been, get this, no bigger than this rectangle I have on the board. The stones could be no bigger than 19 inches wide, 36 inches long, because you've got a 40 inch box that's two inches thick on either side, so you've got to take off four inches. Means 36 is the maximum if it fit in there with a hair's breadth. And because you've got 23 inches on this width, You've got to take off four inches. That means 19 inches is the maximum. Actually, this is probably just a little large if we're using this rule as the, as the cubic for that build. So that's the size of one of those two tablets that Moses was going to have to carve out and carry up. Now, I got news for you. A stone that big is going to be heavy, cut out of flint. It is. And so Moses was going to cut two of those and was going to carry them up. Now, when we come to verse 6 through 9 here in chapter 10, I need to tell you this. They were inserted a long time ago in the text. Both Wycliffe and Tyndale included them in their original translations into English from both the Latin and from the Hebrew. However, they are not found in the oldest and most reliable copies that we have of the, the Hebrew Bible, okay? They're just not there. And so, uh, the New American Standard Version, which we are using places these verses, verses 6 through 9, inside of parentheses to indicate that they were not part of the, orig the original text that was delivered by, uh, by the Lord to Moses. However, the editors of the NASV Bible uh, were kind enough 
to mark these verses in parentheses, which means the information found in these three verses, uh, 6 through 9, 6, 7, 8, 9, these four verses, can be found somewhere else in the Bible. Had they been in brackets, that would have meant we don't know where that came from. But in the beginning notes in the front of every Bible, and when you get a Bible, you need to open it and you need to read the forward notes and the preface and the general formatting and how they do the translating, and they will tell you what all the special little asterisks and italics and all of that means. Well, parentheses means that passage that is there is found in the Bible, but it's not found where it is here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. It's found over in Numbers 33. So how did it get over in Deuteronomy? Well, most likely, it was written in the margin of a minister's copy as a note. Now remember, we didn't have printing presses until the 1500s, 1550s in fact. And so every copy of every Bible was handwritten. And they had copyists or scribes who would take and write down and recopy these lines, these, these Bibles and pages word for word. And so probably a minister wrote the, Deuter uh, the Numbers 33 passage out in the side of the notes. And when his, his copy got worn and tattered, they were very respectful of their Bibles and their pa the pages of the Scripture. They would take it and have it recopied. And then the original that they had that was theirs would ceremonially be burned so that it would not fall into disrepute by anyone, anywhere, or anything going on like that. And so it would not ever be used for some uh, unholy purpose. And so when the minister had a new copy made, because his was worn and tattered, the scribe in included right into the, into the text the notes that were written out to the side. Now, you have to remember that the text was written in handwriting and the note was written in, written in handwriting. So we need not deal with the content of these, these four verses. And for information about the content, uh, you need to, uh, only to go over to uh, my website at jimhastings.org. Go pull up Numbers Lesson 20 and go see that, the notes on those verses in chapter 33 of the book of Numbers, Numbers Lesson 20. And we won't spend time here with that because we've got a little ways to go before we, but before we get through here today. And I just want to tell you, we are not going to deal with these passages that are in this scripture because they were not included in the, the oldest and most reliable copies, I should say it that way, that we have of the Hebrew, Hebrew script. Now Moses reminded the camp <clears throat> as they were there, right there on the plain of Moab, that he stayed up on that mountain 40 years before for 40 days and 40 nights the second time. And while there, he pleaded with the Lord not to destroy the nation uh, because of what they had done with the golden calf. I mean, the Lord had said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Moses uh, turns around, goes right up the mountain. He's only been gone. They've heard this. They've heard these Ten Commandments not more than 40 days before, uh, not longer than 40 days before. And what do they do? They, they, they made a graven image and made it their God and went playing around it. So Moses had uh, pleaded with the Lord not to destroy the nation, but to allow the nation to continue on and possess the promised land. And that happened in verse number 10. I, moreover, stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights like the first time. And the Lord listened to me that time also. And the Lord was not willing to destroy you. And then the Lord said to me, Arise, proceed on your journey ahead of the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So the Lord granted Moses in his plea that he would come down from the mountain, they would do the things they're going to have to do to get ready with the tabernacle and all that, <clears throat> and then he would lead the nation on to the place where that nation could go and take the promised land as their own, uh, as their own possession, just as the Lord had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. 
But the granting of Moses' plea to not destroy them was not without a requirement of the people. It was not a new requirement. It was actually part of the Ten Commandments. But those awaiting down at the foot of Mount Sinai were still a stiff-necked and rebellious people. And Moses would lead them from there to Kadesh Barnea where the spies would go out and be sent into the promised land. And when they came back with the report, the nation would rebel and be sent back to Mount Sinai for 38 more years because it was going to take a year for them to make that trip and get back there 38 more years at Mount Sinai. But this is the book of Deuteronomy and Moses is delivering this message to a new generation of Israelites that they are ready to cross that Jordan River and to go over and to take the promised land on the west side of the Jordan. And to them, Moses gives the requirements for her to possess the promised land just as he gave it to the older generation that did not get to go. He gives it to this new generation in verse 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and love Him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and His statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. First of all, the nation was to fear the Lord your God. Now to fear from the Hebrew means to have a reverence for the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means to revere the Lord, to respect Him, to have an awe for Him. Second, the nation was to walk in all His ways. That is a general instruction to do things God's way and not man's ways because the Lord had already told him how to walk in His ways. Third, the nation was to love Him the people were to have an undying affection for the Lord. And fourth, the nation was to serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. Now the service of the Lord was to consume the heart and the soul of each person in the nation. Service to Him was to be their inmost passion, their inmost desire. And fifth, the nation was to keep the Lord's commandments and His statutes for your good. The commandments and the statutes were built on the commandments and they were pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. And He wants His people to be holy and righteous in an unholy and an unrighteous world. He wants them to be different. And keeping the commandments and the statutes of the Lord guaranteed the blessings and the great fortunes that the Lord could provide. And the Lord would provide all the good in the world for Israel on one condition. And that was that she kept His laws. So then Moses says something interesting. He says, Behold. Now, we wouldn't use the word behold today. Uh, Today, we would say it like this. We would say, pay attention to this. That's what the word behold means. Pay attention. Verse 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all people, it as it is this day. So the Lord owns everything, Moses says. He owns the heavens. He owns the earth. He owns everything. Yet he chose a certain part of his creation. He chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all their descendants to give his affection of love to And that affectionate love applied to every person standing in front of Moses there on the plains of Moab. Even they belonged to the Lord and he loved them. 
Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Now, all things would be good for Israel if she kept his commandments and statutes because everything belongs to the world, to the Lord anyway. Everything belongs to the Lord. He can give Israel all she needs because he owns all she needs. But Moses warned that there were things that the Lord would not do. Verse 16. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Now when Moses says circumcise your heart, he is asking the people to cut away all that is not needed in their lives. Just as circumcision cuts something away, cut it away from your heart. The people are to put away the worldly principles and to set their hearts on the divine principles given by the Lord. But in order to do that, the Jews had to stiffen your neck no longer, he said. Uh, people who balk at the laws and do what they want and what they desire at their own peril are said to be stiff-necked. The word means stubborn or, ob or obstinate. Being, ob being opposite of stubborn means that the people had to be regenerate and had to be willing to comply fully with the Lord, not being stubborn and obstinate, but being regenerate. But why was that important to the Lord? For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. Now we come to the things that the Lord would not do. He would not show partiality nor take a bribe. Partiality means a one-sidedness unjust or unreasonable preference for one party over another. Moses is warning in this passage that the nation of Israel, even though the Lord chose to love her and to care for her, that he would not show a partiality to her, show an unjust or unreasonable care and favor for her, if she refused to love him and to follow his laws. Moses also used the word bribe. It means to pilfer, to steal, to take dishonestly, or to practice extortion. He's warning Israel that the nation cannot willfully sin against the Lord and expect the Lord to continue to bless them with His generous gifts to meet all their needs. He will not allow Israel to steal from the world and proclaim that God gave her permission because He owns it all and He loves the nation of Israel. Neither will he allow the people of the nation to go through the motions of keeping the law when their hearts are not in it. That would be a bribe to the Lord, and he will not show the nation partiality and bless them. But then Moses turned to the things that the Lord would do in spite of the actions of the nation of Israel. Verse 18. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Now all around us there are orphans, there are widows, there are aliens who have nothing and need help. First we come to that word orphan. Today, we apply the definition of an orphan to being a child who has lost both parents, being a child. 
but that's not the original meaning of the word. At that time, anyone of any age who lost both parents and biological siblings who had no blood family relations were considered orphans. So an old woman who never married, never had children, would be considered an orphan when her parents died. Just such a person the Lord would execute judgment for. Now, the word widow means a female whose husband has died. And in the ancient world, men owned everything and had all the rights to everything, and the women were just considered property. So widowed women would by necessity fall under the protection of the nearest male relative. But that did not mean that the nearest male relative would treat her with dignity and with respect. The Lord would execute justice for widows who were not cared for in a righteous way. Now the word alien in Deuteronomy, no matter where you see it, means a person who is not a Jew. Specifically, not a descendant of Jacob through the family of the 70 who entered down into Egypt at the bidding of Joseph at the time of the famine. And when entering the promised land and taking all the Canaanite territory to be their own, non-Canaanites would still be living in the land along with the Jews. Who would some of these non-Canaanites be? Because remember the Canaanites were to be destroyed totally, all of them killed. Well, all of the descendants of Abraham and Isaac who were not descendants of Jacob would be called aliens because they were not part of the nation of Israel. To be specific for just a moment, all the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. They would be aliens. They were not of the nation of Israel. Just to list a few more names, let's see here. They would be the Moabites. If you remember, the Moabites were here in this area, and they didn't fight the Moabites. There'd be Ammonites right there, the uh, descendants of Ammon. They wouldn't fight the Ammonites. No, they, were, they took care of them because they're descendants of Lot. Moab and Ammon were the two boys of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. But they're still considered aliens. Down here in the... Uh, Mount Sinai area is where uh, Moses married a Midianite woman. Uh, Moses' wife was Midianite. So all the Moabites, the Amorites, the Midianites, and there's other ones, by the way, they're all cousins of the nation of Israel, but they're not part of the nation of Israel. So the Lord wanted Israel to take care for all the non-Canaanite aliens living in the promised land, just as Egypt cared for Israel most of the 430 years she was in Egypt. The care was to be a true care filled with a genuine love and action. The word love Moses used there because the Lord did. It was not just to be lip service. It was to be true. So there were things Israel must do to obtain all the good the Lord had in store for them in the promised land. We find that in verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve Him and cling to Him. You shall swear by His name. He is your praise and He is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. So Moses now came full circle back again that we've already seen to the things Israel must do to stay in the good graces of the Lord. First, you shall fear the Lord your God. Fear still means reverence. It still means awe. It still means respect, as we talked about back in verse 16. Second, you shall serve Him and cling to Him. 
Now in this place, to serve means to render habitual obedience. That's what the word serve means. Habitual means it is your inherent nature. It is what you are and what you do because it is what you think and it is how you think without having to think about it. It's habitual. Most of us have something that we're habitual about. Let me say that again. I like that little phrase, uh, that little sentence. It's what you are and it's what you do because it's what you think and it's how you think without having to think about it. It's just habitual with you. We all know what it means to clean. Just as a child clings to the leg of a father or a mother, so too the Jews were to cling to the Lord. Third, he says, you shall swear by his name. To swear means to promise. And that you make your promises that are made because of his name. Israel was to forever attach the name of the Lord to themselves. Because of that, the Lord required that all promises be made with the knowledge and the mindset that Israel represented the Lord. Therefore, Israel should represent the Lord well. When you take an oath, when you sign a pledge, both are promises. Promises should not be, be signed rashly. In the case of the signing of an oath, a pledge, or any kind of, a, of agreement, great care must be observed that all things written within the document are truthful and just. But when it's time to promise, you must do so in His name as His representative. That means you cannot bear a false witness. You cannot steal. You cannot covet within that promise. Fourth, He is your praise and He is your God, Moses said. And with your focus on the Lord, you must declare as much with your praise. Now I know we flaunt the word praise around like praise and worship and we think it's music and all of that. Now, praise, when placed in the first English translation, meant to assess, to set a price, to set a value, to prize, to hold in high esteem with great admiration. It means nothing less here in this verse because the Lord is your God. No other nation had seen such might and works as the nation of Israel. And from the care they found with Joseph as second in command of Egypt until the time they arrived at the plains of Moab, other nations had never seen the bits and the pieces of the Lord's care that the nation of Israel had seen. From 70 who entered into Egypt to hundreds of thousands there who were ready to cross the Jordan River and for the promised land, the only one they could respect, love, serve, promise, and admire was the Lord God of all creation. Moses was not through with his things Israel must do when they enter the promised land. And he continued on in chapter 11, as we are too, with the rewards of Israel's obedience if they would be great in every way towards the Lord. Boy, the Lord would do great things for them. Chapter 11, verse 1. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and always keep His charge, His statutes, His ordinances, and His commandments. Know this day that I am not speaking with your sons who have not known and who have not seen the discipline of the Lord your God, His greatness, His mighty hand, and His outstretched arm, and His signs and His works, which He did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land, and what He did to Egypt's army, to its horses, and its chariots, 
when he made the waters of the Red Sea to engulf them while they were pursuing you, and the Lord completely destroyed them, and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram and the sons of Elab, the son of Reuben, when the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them among all Israel. But your own eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord, which he did. While still in Egypt, the Israelites had seen the Lord inflict upon the Egyptians the blood, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, the livestock, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and finally, number 10, the death of the firstborn. Not one of those plagues bothered any Israelite, not one, who was living in the same vicinity as the Egyptians who got it bad. What a sign and a work that the Lord had done. Cornered on that sandy beach, down in Nubia, Egypt. High mountains that surrounded them from behind and to the north and to the south. Mountains that fell off into the sea with only one way in and one way out of that beach. The Lord blocked the Egyptian army at the cut and opened up the sea and dried the ground for the nation of Israel to, so they could cross through it. And the nation of Israel had no choice but to go one direction. And no choice but to trust the Lord. Down, down, further they went as they walked across that sea, that dry seabed, going down, 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 with the walls of the water on, on each side of them standing hundreds of feet high, blown back by the breath of God. And they got to the bottom in the middle, and then up, 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 they had to climb the slow slope uh, up the eastern side of that sea. And then the Lord moved from that cut and he allowed the Egyptian army to see those, those walls of water and see that dry path right across. And that Egyptian army followed the nation across. And once they were down, down, down in the midst of the sea with hundreds of feet of water walls on each side of them, the Lord stopped the wind and the water fell. And the army of Pharaoh drowned. More incredible signs and works of the Lord. In the wilderness, the water of the springs were bitter. And so a branch was cut and thrown into it to make it sweet when the Lord told Moses to throw it in. At Mount Sinai, there was no water. A strike of the rock brought water from the flint that provided the nation water for 40 years. Food was needed, so there was manna every day, just the right amount. Meat was needed, so there was quail. And in one case, it was three feet deep and as far as the eye could see. And there they heard at that Mount Sinai the voice of the Lord speak to the nation from the fire on the mountain. What mighty signs and works the Lord has done for the nation of Israel that they and only they have seen. Then there was the rebellion of Dathan, Abiram, and the son of Reuben. And the Lord told Moses to have the people stand back because they had rebelled, and that they surely needed to do. For the Lord opened up the ground and swallowed up their tents, their tent pegs, their stuff, their beds, their curtains, their pots, their pans, their kids, and all of them in tune to the tune of about 24,000 people, rebellious men, rebellious women, rebellious boys and girls. Has any other nation seen such signs and works? They had not. Not one. But Israel had. And sure, Israel would be rewarded for their obedience to the Lord. But the obedience would also have its reward in the promised land because of the difference between the land of Egypt and the land of Israel verse 8 
You shall therefore keep every commandment which I am commanding you today so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it. So that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land into which you are about to cross to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from the beginning even to the end of the year. Here the Lord has given us a little clue of what life was like concerning agriculture back in Egypt when they were there 430 years. There the seed that the Jews planted had to be nursed along with daily watering. In other words, getting the plants to grow was not an easy task is what Moses is saying here and the Lord is saying uh, through Moses. But in the new promised land, with an obedient following of the Lord, He promised, the Lord promised, that He would care for the watering of the seeds to the full harvest. From the beginning to the end, for every harvest that was out there, He'd take care of it. Now I want you to know that is a deal from the Lord that they should take. But the Lord was not going to make a blanket promise to Israel without a restriction. He was not going to give that deal without expecting something. The warning concerning rain or no rain, we call this, because Moses had a 40-year history with the camp too, just like the Lord, and he knew Israel was a rebellious and a stubborn and a stiff-necked nation who was not prone to a life of, of obedience. My stars, in less than 40 days, after they heard the voice of the Lord from the fire on the mountain, give them the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not make any graven images, they did. Therefore, there was the warning concerning the rain or no rain, verse 13. It shall come about, if you listen obediently to my commands, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and all your soul, that He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil, and He will give grass in your fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Beware that your hearts are not deceived, that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them, or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and He will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield its fruit, and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Once again, The Lord announces through Moses that the care and the watering of the fields was totally dependent on their love for Him as their only God. Done. No ands, no buts about it. The moment Israel started to worship a false god, the deal was off. No more rain. How were the people of the nation going to remember to be faithful and obedient to the Lord through every generation in order to experience the blessing of rain in all seasons for all the crops in a year. The Lord through Moses had the warning concerning the words of the Lord found in verse 18. He says, You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall teach them to your sons talking of them when you sit in your house 
and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens remain above the earth. We saw this same warning before, almost verbatim. Back in chapter 6, verse 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. <clears throat> Impress the word of the Lord in your heart and your soul. Hold it in your hand. Memorize it. Keep it, at, keep it at the forefront of your mind. Teach it to your sons everywhere you are all day long and write it on the door frames of your house and on your gates. That's how you remember it. And tell your sons to teach it to their sons. As long as you live by the words of the Lord, the Lord will take care of you through all time. Simple as that. Then Moses gave the people a warning concerning the promised land and their battles to take those, that land for themselves. Verse 22. For if you are careful to keep all this commandment which I am commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and hold fast to Him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon and from the river to the river Euphrates. As far as the western sea, no man will be able to stand before you. The Lord your God will lay the dread of you and the fear of you on the land on which you set foot as he has spoken to you. The victory would be easy based on one thing. The nation of Israel had to be careful to keep all the commandment, to love the Lord, to walk in His way, to hold fast to Him. Listen to it again. First, careful to keep all this commandment. Second, to love the Lord. Third, to walk in all His ways. Fourth, to hold fast to Him. For that heart among the Jews, the Lord would do the rest. If they would do those things within their heart, within their soul, the Lord promised to do the rest. Now to round out this section of Moses' message to the nation, as they sat there on the plain of Moab, in the Arabah, remember the Arabah is that sandy area on either side of the Jordan River as it go, cuts and goes around with the mountains on either side of it. On the east side of the Jordan River, that's where they are. They're on the east side. They're going to go to the west side. He made this announcement there on that east side of the blessings and the curses of the Lord. And he did it in a warning. Verse 26. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing... If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. Moses promises that the Lord will bless the nation of Israel beyond all imagination. As long as it remains true and faithful to Him, alone as their only God and to exhibit that faithfulness through keeping His commandments. But if the nation ever begins to worship other fake gods, curses will come and the blessings will dry up. Moses set this choice before the people there on that east side of the Jordan River in the Arabah because as soon as they crossed over to the west side of the Jordan River, while they're still in the Arabah on the other side of the river, the Lord had a requirement for them concerning the blessings and the curses. So what is the requirement of the Lord for the nation of Israel when they cross to the west side of the Jordan River? 
Moses gave them the Lord's instruction in verse 29. It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not across the Jordan, west of the way toward the sunset, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah opposite Gilgal, beside the oaks of Moray? For you are about to cross the Jordan to go to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall possess it and live in it. And you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the judgments which I am setting before you today. The crossing point of the Jordan River for the nation of Israel <clears throat> to traverse over to the other side was just west of the camp right here. Just west of the camp. That's where it is. From the camp of the plain of Mo on the plains of Moab. That place would be the point where the nation was entering to possess, at the, as the scripture says, entering to possess the promised land. And from there, from right there on the plains of Moab, they could look across. And the people could see that little village right there in the red dot called Gilgal, there in the Arabah, or just across the Jordan. And beyond Gilgal, they could see the peaks of Mount Gerizim, that's that mount, and Mount Ebal, now that's a little far out, but you know what I'm saying, it's a picture to give you an idea. They could see those mounts over there. They knew where it was. Just across the Jordan. And at the foot of those two mountains, Gerizim and Ebal, there was another place, another little village called Shechem, just beyond the opposite of Gilgal. It was Canaanite territory. Nevertheless, once the nation was in Shechem, a ceremony was to take place with the announcement of the Lord's blessings spoken on Mount Gerizim and the announcement of the Lord's curses spoken on Mount Ebal. Now I want to remind you the picture that I'm showing you right now of those two mountains. That town of Shechem was not, Shechem was not built out like that. That's the way it looks today. Now that, the, back then it was just a village and believe me, the whole nation of Israel could have gone in on it and be fine. So we'll discuss that ceremony that happened up on Mount Gerizim and Mount, and Mount Ebal when we arrive in the book of Joshua and we will study the chapter, that in chapter 8 of the book of Joshua. And what a great and moving ceremony that will be for the nation of Israel and it will be a great lesson for us in the future. But for now, because our time is running out, Moses had completed this part of his message there on the plains of Moab. And he will now begin to summarize the laws of the Lord. As, as we will begin chapter 12 next week in next week's study, that's where we will pick that up. May we all be faithful to the Lord and keep His commandments even still today in our lives. Lord Jesus, please help us do that. And we yearn for that and we plead for that. We want to be faithful to you and we want to serve you habitually. And we want to keep everything in our minds, at the front of our minds and in our hearts and in our souls, in our hands, on our doorpost, on our gates, that you are our Lord, the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In your name, amen.